I was thinking, is there anyone who has not taken a snapshot of the plate of food and posted it on social media? <laughs> there are some, actually. Oh, my goodness. Uh, and then not be tempted to actually compose something out of squashes and a papaya in their kitchen and feel so sympathetic towards those squashes and the papayas. Friendship, actually. <laughs> And, and so I'm, I'm just talking about myself in this regard, in fact, uh, and my own handiwork, as it were. I really um, started working on food as a research project, not with food at first, but with practices of feasting and gatherings of, of courtly nature, elite households, cafe culture, and so forth in the city of Esfahan in central Iran, where food then began to gradually grow on me in terms of actually an obsession. In other words, not only is it my obsession, but also the obsession of this 16th, 17th century people of, uh, of Safavid Iran, with Esfahan in particular as the core point. So I keep thinking about how do we deal with food, or how do we enter through food to ask questions that would be relevant to art history, or how does food inform art history? So aside from my composition, this is my training. I'm, I'm trained as a Renaissance art historian primarily, and then an Islamic art history as my field that I then did my research mostly in it. So in the Renaissance, or the traditions of study of European arts, we will look at food in terms of the symbolic, the iconographic, thinking about these uh, items, the bread, the loaf of bread, the basket of fruit, and so forth, uh, and uh, the way in which they speak to the mystery of Christ's sacrifice and allow us to to compose all kinds of interpretive uh, uh, patterns in thinking about uh, Caravaggio's painting here. But what do we do when we get to a field of study like mine, where such iconographic traditions have had absolutely no footing? There's nothing I can do with reading of items of food or objects in these paintings and other uh, other environments, visual environments, where I can say this means that. Uh, so what do I do actually when I'm dealing with a bowl, a banal object of daily use? In this case, the bowl itself, which I happened upon it, it has been in the Metropolitan Museum of Art for a very long time. And when I was a graduate student, I just happened to notice what's written on it, which says, Nik boshat kara osh, sohbat ku neku naboshat ku mabosh. And it does make some, some kind of a poetic, rhythmic, musical sound in addition. And there it says, and I roughly translated it, as long as the soup is good, who cares if the bowl is not beautiful? So, and it's really fantastic in the sense that it really triggered in my mind this question of what does this mean, really? In other words, the bowl sits in the museum, in a museum case, as a work of art, actually. And it says to you that if I'm not beautiful, who cares, as long as the soup is delicious. And indeed, it does have another side to it, which is, these are objects of utility. So if you are a historian of the arts of the Islamic world, you just stack them up as typologies of objects. So what does this tell me about food? Or food tells me about art. In other words, how as a historian of art I come to work with this material is actually triggered by looking at and noticing the very uh, um, dense um, clustering of evidence of food obsession in paintings, 
and objects of food, uh, service, eating, drinking, and so forth, and in actually treatises, which we would call cookbooks today, but treatises that would be about food, and they will have not only questions of recipes, but also medicinal aspects of food as part of the whole idea. What got me interested was actually to think about the way in which these objects convey something of the food culture of 17th century Esfahan, that there is actually a relevance between what is depicted, the objects that speak to themselves and to us, like the one that I showed you, and what may be actually coming through the food culture of the time. And so one thing that I've come to realize is, and I need to open this one up, is to say, for instance, that in this uh, early 16th century, these are all related to that period of the Safavi dynasty's rule in greater Iran. So in the 16th century, a chef, a famous chef in, a, in an elite household, writes a treatise in which he says, or gives a recipe, for instance, for a poloye siyah, a black rice. And he describes how you make it black, not by putting some coloring in it, but by the way you compose various items, fruits and nuts and, and herbs and meats, in such a way that the color composition conveys something of the blackness of the rice. And then he describes how you set it up in what kind of a dish, as in a round, big round platter of the chini type, that is the Chinese porcelain, very specifically pointing to blue and white, that you must deliver the rice in this big Chinese platter, that you must put it together in such a way that one sees the beauty of each item as it is composed. In other words, he talks about a composition of food above or inside this big, big platter. And then he says, he who cooks it must put it together and must deliver and serve it because he alone knows how this uh, connects the visual beauty with the gustatory uh, beauty of the food that he delivers. So I began to look at objects, then looked at food material to really reassemble the way in which the food uh, culture of the period tells me about the, uh, what I would call a taste, a taste for beauty, a taste for uh, the visual aspects of what we eat, but also the visual aspects of the objects that are the accoutrements of eating and conviviality, actually. And that has led me to look at and gather a mass of material that is extraordinary for this 15, late 15th into the 17th century in the Persian context of the works of art, in which actually a cook is depicted, people that I would cons we would call them the food industry or food service industry today. So the riffraff, the kitchen riffraff, if you will, the servers, the guys who, who grill, the guys who mix the soup, the ones who make the noodles, all of that becomes a subject matter of great interest. And none of it has been actually studied in studies of Persian painting as material that becomes a mediator towards other under forms of understanding of knowledge production in this period. And the way in which, when you depict a cook actually tasting something, literally tasting it, which is really an unusual feature in Persian painting, that ought to say something about, in other words, this massing of information, something about the way in which the idea of taste and the beauty that is conveyed or the visual harmony that is conveyed 
through the, te uh, the, the paintings and the objects, as well as through description of how food is put together, should come together as one. And in fact, to, uh, uh, to wrap this up, this has led me to look at things like this, these dense displays uh, for which the v &A has served me very well, the top <laughs> floor of the v &A. It basically proved something about what I was saying all along, or thinking I'm saying, by way of displaying the objects, which is to say, these si this side of the stacks, and there are many of them further out, is the side of the Safavi 16th and 17th century ceramic dishes, this side is the Ottoman ones. So you actually can understand this particularity of a food culture by comparing it also locally or regionally, if you will. So by comparing what are the food habits of Safavi Iran or Esfahan with the food habits of Ottoman Turkey or Istanbul, that's when I began to see that the number of large platters and small bowls for wine cups, and little dishes, and lots of wine bottles, of which none is visible here, lots of them, <laughs> says that these Persians in the 17th century were really partying. And, <laughs> and, and, and that there were, and, and very, very impressively, these courses of food, what we think is a French habit of eating, is actually well established in 17th century, early 17th century, at these uh, courts and elite households in Esfahan, where you would start with uh, sweets and, and fruits and then move on to stews. And rice was a very special dish. Not everybody would have rice. And end, finally, with drinking. In other words, you would start drinking after you have completely filled your stomach. Makes a lot of sense, actually. <laughs> and if you go to a home of an Iranian, the first thing they serve you are bowls of fruit into which cucumbers are placed, too. And the most shocking thing is to offer you something like cucumbers as part of a fruit basket before you even begin to eat. So these have basically told me, uh, or the other way around, reading about cookbooks and the way in which food is handled and this anthropology of food, if you will, as my sort of an angle of approach to these objects have, have helped me to reposition otherwise banal <coughs> objects into a context of high art, high culture and practices around it. And finally, just to close the circle, the chef, uh, one of the court chefs uh, who we know he wrote a cookbook also early 17th century, um, uh, and he's very well known for the very fact that he is, there are only two chefs' names in this period. This is one of them. And there is a painting, a mural painting in the Chehel Sutun Palace, which may have him portrayed. He has a very uh, protruding stomach. Uh, and he's serving food. Uh, and he says the opposite of what I started with, with the, uh, with the bowl. He says, cook badly, but serve beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.